All right, I can't believe we are already to September, almost through 2020, and this may be the best episode we will ever have. <laughs> From our surprise guests to my confession, it's just, you don't wanna miss this month. So anyways, it's also Henley, who's laying back on the couch here. It's her birthday month. Uh, she turned three on September 18th, your grandpa. So in honor of her and how much we all love her and Husker Nation loves her, uh, we're going to do another giveaway. So all the details will come out when uh, we launch this month's episode, but it'll be more of a giveaway for all of the Husker fans who are dog lovers. How do you think about, what do you think about that? Well, we have a lot of dog lovers and uh, I, it seems like with COVID, a lot of our players have acquired dogs or puppies. So yeah. I'm just wondering how they're going to manage all that once we get back to full-time go training mode and playing mode. They've talked to me and I'm going to puppy sit. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So, so. We'll, Henley will have some friends. We have a fenced in backyard and, and I'll just go pick up their dogs and puppy sit while they're at practice. We'll probably just bring them to Devaney and make a little dog run out here and let them all play. Or they could help shag balls maybe. <laughs> yeah. Make practice a little more efficient. Yeah. Our Irish Wolfhound ruin coming into Vanny. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so I want to do a quick catch up with you before we bring on our surprise guest. So first of all, we always talk about Yellowstone. Do you have your Yellowstone vest with you? Uh, not with me right now in my office, but I'm, I'm waiting for the first chilled day to wear it into the office. <laughs> okay, I have it. I, I, I'm prepared because I figured you might not have it with you. Here we go. It's kind of <laughs> for everyone to see Coach Cook Good. in his Yellowstone Dutton Ranch. If anyone watches Yellowstone and his cowboy hat. I'm glad I got my confession out of the way already. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it's a great picture. You look like you could be a part of the uh, movie cast. They call me, I'm there. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so tell us where everything's at, what you guys are up to right now. I know yesterday they just released that you're gonna be starting January 22nd, uh, finishing up. I think the selection show is like April 4th or something, and then your championship will be April 23rd through the 25th in Omaha. So take us through just kind of what you're doing right now and then what the next few months will look like in preparation for the spring season. Well, right now we're trying to get everybody back in the gym and we're, we're under what's called eight hours per week. So, uh, which means you have eight hours to lift, run, and, or uh, you can use four of those hours to be in the gym. So right now we're only using two of those hours because six of our hours, we're trying to build our base back up to get ready for a long grinding season, you know, that ends in uh, April. So uh, because we gave them time off and then, um, what I found interesting about this COVID, if one athlete tests positive and they've all been around, they all got a quarantine, doesn't matter what sport, what team. So we've had players in and out of quarantine because they're around somebody that potentially tested positive. And uh, so it's been kind of chaotic not having everybody here, but our goal is to have everybody back in here by Monday, uh, about when this podcast comes out. And, uh, and now what, what's happening is you have to go through much more extensive testing. Now the big 10 has put in some serious rules about coming out of quarantine or coming out of a positive test. Uh, it's basically, you're looking at 21 days. So uh, they, they've either set this thing up where it's almost going to be impossible to have sports or it's going to be really motivating for our athletes not to mess around and try, you know, get COVID, even though, you know, I know that some of them don't do it on purpose but making sure they don't go into situations. So uh, that could be risky. So that's where we're at. And then in October, we're gonna crank up to what we call 20 hours per week, which means it's like in season. And you get so many days throughout the year, including the counting the season and when we're playing. Uh, so we're kind of waiting to use those and start those. And we'll start in mid-October on that. And then we're going to go all the way and, and try to be prepared to play a great match opening on the 22nd because 
January 22nd, there's not, you're not going to play into the season. You're not going to have some non-conference matches to mess around. We're going to open with Big Ten matches. And it's, it, right now, we're not sure of the schedule or how many weeks it'll be, but we're hoping for 11-week schedule, 22 matches in the Big Ten. It's going to be really challenging. And you're going to have to come out and, and get off to a great start and be really solid because – the challenge, Lauren, is the NCAA tournament, which was announced yesterday, is only 48 teams. 32 of those teams are automatic qualifiers, meaning they're coming from all the conferences. So that only leads 16 teams at large. So if you want to for sure get in the, in the tournament, you got to win your conference and become an automatic qualifier. And tell everyone what you and I were talking about last night, your prediction for you don't have you said you don't have the schedule yet, but how you think that's going to look? with playing the same team back to back. And I know that's just a, a guess and a lot of it is up in the air right now, but just talk us through that. Yeah, we really don't know for sure, but if I had to speculate today that we will play 11 weeks, uh, if not 10, so 20 matches, and, and you'll play, let's just say it's 10 match or 10 weeks, you'll play five, on the, five weekends on the road, five weekends at home, and you'll play the same team on those weekends. So, you know, if we go play, you know, first weekend we go to Minnesota, we'll play them Friday and Saturday there and then come back and then we host somebody here for two matches the next week. You know, we've been, I know football right now has been told no fans. We're hoping by the spring we're allowed to have fans. I don't want to get our fans too fired up, but let's, uh, we're going to hope for that and work towards that. I know you're going to push hard for that. So can you also confirm the championship's going to be in Omaha? I can't promise that, but uh, Omaha's fired up, has the dates, they're ready to go. So okay. uh, that's a decision that will come from the NCAA. I don't see any reason why they wouldn't have it in Omaha. And then when you go to your fall season, you would it would be the next stop that, or the next championship uh, home that they've talked about is Columbus, correct? So in the fall, it would just keep moving along. Right. So hopefully, we go back into a normal fall schedule and Columbus hosts the 2021 national championship. Um, now, maybe everybody will like spring volleyball so much that we'll punt that and just go move it to the spring. You can keep dreaming. I don't think that's going to happen. And then uh, some other news that came out is your incoming freshman, who I know you can't name, but uh, there are a couple players who are coming in January. They are not allowed to play this spring season, correct? Yeah, first they were told they could come. Everything would be good and they were eligible. And then last week, the NCAA came out and said, if you're a mid-year enrollee, which our incoming freshmen would be, and every college program has people that come in early, um, they're not eligible to play in the spring. So, uh, but we're anticipating having some players come early, which is great. And, you know, the, the positive for that is it gives them eight, nine months to acclimate, get ahead academically, uh, and be prepared for the 2021 season by being in our gym, being with our strength coaches, training in our systems. So uh, it's a, still a huge advantage. And, and I know a lot, you know, they have to plan way ahead to do this because they've got to academically graduate a, a semester early. So they've been thinking about this for a long time. And then the ones that don't uh, come early, Typically, they're multi-sport athletes, so they they want to play basketball, they want to do track, uh, or they go to a school that doesn't allow people to graduate early. And typically, those are the parochial schools or private schools. Do you know if a lot of other schools within the Big Ten are going to have mid-year enrollees? Or I, I haven't tracked it, but every year there's everybody usually has one or two. It's very very common. So you guys are kind of at somewhat of an advantage. If you have How's multiple that? players coming in January who get to train yeah. with you and. Yeah, it's a, to me, it's a no brainer. And I think, you know, by the time you get your senior year, I mean, there's some fun senior things to do, but 
they're tired of club volleyball. They've already done everything. They're senioritis. Their parents are sick of them. <laughs> so, <laughs> so to me, it's, it's a great, great opportunity. Uh, but I want to make this really clear. We, it's always the family's decision and the player's decision what they want to do. We just right. say, here's what you got to do if you want to come early. And, you know, if you don't, we'll see you in the summer, in June. Perfect timing. Man, this is, a, this is like a job interview. I don't want to mess it up. <laughs> <laughs> what time's your tea time today? I don't, I don't have tea time. I had, a, I had an 8 a.m. class and a 9 a.m. compliance and a 10 a.m. head coaches meeting. Wow. Highlight of my day. He's working that's, his that's, butt off, and you're, you're just sitting back doing nothing today. You have an off day. And that's, and that's the way I think, it, and that's why I'm here, as I love that she gets to talk to you the way we all wish we could. <laughs> hey, Coach Rose, I, this is Lauren's podcast, but, you know, Lauren mentioned to me the other day, preparing for this, that yeah, Coach Rose teaches a class. She goes, do you have to teach classes? So I find it fascinating that you still teach. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about what class it is and why you'd still do it? Well, we're recording, right? This is all for your show, right? This is all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. good. Well, I mean, John, when I, when I came here, I had one-third coaching, one-third teaching activity classes, and one-third teaching professional classes because I was a phys ed teacher. That was my world that I really came from. So... Uh, all of the coaches taught here except for Coach Paterno and the basketball coaches. So I always just felt that was a, a good thing, and I liked that it kind of allowed me to stay in touch with, uh, with the students, whereas you know how it is. There's some players that you're dealing with that are interested and they want to do what you're talking about, and some kids it's like pulling teeth. But – you'd like to think that the kids that are taking classes are there because they want to be there. So, you know, my class that I teach now for a long time, I was teaching elementary education, but now I teach an ethics class. So ethics and coaching is easy because every day you can go in the paper and pull things out. And I mean, literally if I just went current events every day, I wouldn't even have to go any further than just looking at, you know, what's going on in the Big Ten and the Big 12, just the Power Five schools would, would keep me busy. You know, Dad, I love how you say it's my podcast. And, you know, I was planning on introducing Coach Rose and, like, oh, sorry. I, I had all this lined up and then you just jump in with a question. It's your podcast now. Thank you. It's, it technically is our podcast, but <laughs> I run the show. Yeah. So you, you can uh, raise your hand if you want to talk. Uh, okay, so Coach Rose, welcome. I just want to know what everyone calls you. Coach Rose, Russ, R squared. What like what do your players refer to you as? Uh, I mean, I think they call me. I think they call me Coach. They call me. Uh, you know, I think I think they call me Coach mostly. I loved it when uh, the, there was an article one of during the year and. Uh, one of your players called me Russ and I thought it was great. <laughs> and I was like, man, I hope I get a chance to thank her for calling me Russ because that's cool. Uh, but, you know, I, I think it's just, you know, what, whatever really goes on. It's not, it's not a big deal to me at this stage of the game. Yeah. Well, I feel like I'm talking to Bill Belichick and Nick Saban right now. Like the two greats of the volleyball world. And I know Coach Cook wishes he was a football coach instead. Uh, coach Rose, have you always had your eyes set on being a volleyball coach or were you like Coach Cook and wanting to, you know, originally coach in a different sport and then somehow got roped into volleyball? Well, I, 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 would, I would be lying if I said I had volleyball on my mind. I just, I went to, to college and it just so happened that I was at a school that uh, Jim Coleman was at and and got into volleyball so I was there and you know my mentors would have been Jim Coleman and Terry Laskevich and Jerry Angle uh 
so those were kind of the the people that were at at the college there and so my exposures were to him and Doug Beal and Mick Haley and and people that were in the Midwest so it was like that I I didn't think you know it was going to happen the way it happened and there's times I I wish that I would have gone a different direction just because of the amount of money that is paid in football and basketball is so astronomical compared to volleyball and yet you know where where John and I are right now in volleyball is is far surpassed what it was when when I started uh, what the top coaches were getting back then you know UCLA and you know Rudy Sawara your mom's coach people that have been coaching a long time those guys were making twenty five thirty five thousand dollars so the fact that none of us were making any money, you, you really couldn't have a conversation when the answer would have been, do you, do you know how much Andy Banikowski's making at UCLA? And of course the answer would have been no, but if, if you would have known the first number started with a three or a four and it, and it was only 30 something or 40 something, you would have put your tail between your legs and left the room, so. <laughs> okay, do you two consider yourselves well, first of all, do you know what the term BFF means? Yeah, yeah, kind of like when you asked me if I could figure out how a Zoom was going to work. So yeah, yeah. Do you guys consider yourself BFFs? Are you are you good friends, or do you just put on an act, you know, just and really hate each other behind closed doors? You know, you know, Lauren, I don't hate anybody because I'm an old guy and I think it's a waste of energy. I have a I have a lot of respect for your dad. I think he's. Uh, he does a great job. We compete hard against each other, but I have a, I have a great deal of respect uh, for, for the work he does. And uh, but but you know I, you know I want to beat Nebraska like I want to beat everybody else. But uh, you know, we uh, you know we have a good competitive uh, competition when our when our teams are playing. Yeah. Dad, do you have or do I need to raise my hand to say yeah, anything? Yeah, you can or? talk. You can talk now. Okay. <laughs> So I remember uh, Coach Pettit had a saying that co coaching is like being a gunslinger. You don't have many friends when you're a gun fighter or gunslinger, and because uh, you know they're trying to shoot each other. But uh, I've learned more from playing Penn State volleyball as a coach way back to my early days at Wisconsin. Uh, so you know I I give Coach Rose a lot of credit for helping me to become the best coach I can be. And uh, I consider him, I don't know if BFF is <laughs> in our realm, but respect and uh, friendship I've really appreciated uh, over the years and uh, it has really admired what he's done. And, you so, get uh, and, and a lot of my players call you Russ, Coach Rose. <laughs> <laughs> Just when you're, we're, we're, taught, we're playing Penn State, it's, they, they, a lot of them say Russ, so. You should take that as a compliment of affection from the volleyball players. I just want to say, Coach Rose, that the, whenever Nebraska has to play Penn State, that is when Coach Cook is the most worked up. He's nervous all week. He, you can barely have a conversation with him. It's like, you know, we're, I got to prep for Penn State. We're playing Penn State this week. So I think uh, that's a compliment to you and your program and just how successful you all are. I'm, I'm hoping that's when you used to, that, that you, that's when you used to get everything because your mom would just say, hey, your dad's going to be really tied up. Just, just tell him, you know, tell him you need something and you need it. And he'll just say, yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ask your mom. <laughs> She'll take care of it. Everything's okay. That sounds about right. Okay. So back to Bill Belichick. He kind of has a signature look, the cutoff hoodie. Coach Rose, I feel like you ha kind of have a signature look, like your little sweater vest. It, do you have the same, is it like a lucky sweater vest that you wear for every match, or do you have multiple that you rotate through? Well, I, I don't have a vest, but I, I mean, I have uh, sweaters. Like a, yeah, sweater uh, zip up. Uh, yeah, yeah, I think uh, I probably have, I've gone through a number of them that, uh, you know, if I'm lucky uh, in a sweater, I might keep it. If I, if I lose in a sweater, I may give it to a fan on the way out. <laughs> You're superstitious too. 
Yeah, I think there's uh, there, there's maybe something about that. You don't want to roll the dice if you're, you know, you don't want to rock the boat if you're wrong. <laughs> Who knows what what has a bearing? Lauren, you you played. You, you yeah. thought or you you thought all your teammates had it together all the time, huh? I'm I'm just still in the tank because you never recruited me. I, I'm still having you're, PTSD from that. You you were you wanted to go to UCLA. You had it all worked out. <laughs> Okay, so uh, what's your tie to Nebraska volleyball? Because Husker Nation loves you. I, I still don't understand why. And I know you have a tie back in the day to Nebraska volleyball. So just talk us through that. Well, I mean, it's interesting because when I first graduated from George Williams, I, uh, I applied for a couple of jobs and I, and I didn't get uh, any, any jobs. And a couple of the places said you need to get a master's degree. And, uh, and I was like, okay, that sounds okay. And uh, I then coached as an assistant at my alma mater, the men and the women's team, and started bringing back Puerto Rican players. It was kind of, I went and coached pro men's volleyball at uh, 24 years old and uh, started kind of the migration of sending uh, Puerto Rican players back. But uh, when, when I was there, I, I applied to schools in the big eight because they were the top football schools and was looking for uh, graduate assistantships to get a master's degree. So I contacted Oklahoma and Missouri and Nebraska and uh, all of them offered me grad assistantships. But then I had an opportunity to do this pro team. So I said, hey, can I postpone it a year? And they just said, fine. So I had a teaching assistantship and I came right when, uh, and then my summer job, I was always working in this resort uh, in Wisconsin, but Lauren, that's for a whole different show, okay? <laughs> we'll bring you on again. <laughs> it was Dirty Dancing. You have to remember that people would have to watch Dirty Dancing and take a hundred pounds off, and then we'd have a different show. Uh, and it, uh, and I, when I came, it was right when Pat Sullivan was retiring as the coach. And they were like, hey, listen, there's an opening in the coach. Do you want to be the coach? And I said, no, I don't want to be the coach. I'm here to get my master's degree. I've already accepted a teaching assistantship, but I'll, I'll work with whoever you hire. And then Coach Pettit came in. So I was there for uh, two seasons. I got my master's degree and uh, was there for a year and a half. And then when I was leaving, I actually had accepted because Glenn Potter was one of my professors uh, I actually had met with him and had been admitted to BYU to get my doctorate. And then I got the Penn State job instead and have been here for 42 years. So had I not come here, I would have gone to BYU and probably gotten thrown out of there because the person who was kind of the big volleyball guy there, uh, uh, Carl McGowan, uh, is a very, very fine coach he and I, I'm sure, would have got along for about one second. But uh, nonetheless, it, it was, uh, you know, it, it was great. Uh, you know, I, I, so my time, I love my time in Nebraska. So I, I had a degree there. I went around the country, uh, countryside doing clinics. You know, I was doing one-man clinics in Nebraska because I was young and healthy and was a good volleyball player, so it was 70, whatever it was, uh, you know, so, you know, I did half a dozen clinics in, around the state, so I enjoyed my year and a half in Nebraska. This is a question for you both, but if you could coach at any other university, any other women's volleyball program, where would it be and why? Boy, I don't even, you know, I think it would probably just be some little small school in uh, Florida. 
<laughs> so the weather would be good and it would be a division three school. So you could golf every day? Uh, I don't think I would, could, I don't think I would want to golf every day, but I'd like to golf uh, more often than uh, a couple, a couple months a year for sure. But that's at this point in time, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of great places around the country. Certainly, you know, uh, you know, I, I don't, uh, you know, I mean, you know, John came from California, so he probably has great affinity for that area. I, you know, I've never spent enough time out there to, to really appreciate that. You know, we play at Stanford a lot of times and, you know, I like being out there. I don't know if I would enjoy the cost of living out there and I don't like a lot of traffic. So I would have a hard time being in places where traffic would make me crazy. Where would you coach? So Lauren, my, my dream job I've always said was, would be Colorado College, which was a division three school. And actually it's in, it's in uh, Colorado Springs, it's in the mountains, it's, and you know, I spent a lot of time at the training center in Colorado Springs and it was there uh, with volleyball and I just loved it. Your mom trained there when she was playing and always loved it. So we've had that, that affinity for the mountains. And uh, I just always thought that would be the dream job. Teach, coach, not a lot of pressure. You got the mountains and, uh, but my, my other, my other kind of behind the scenes wish would, would have also been Hawaii because I just love Hawaii and the Outrigger Canoe Club. <laughs> so, I could have and, I, and again, I love the passion Hawaiian fans have for volleyball. All right, Coach Rose, how do you, what's your secret to coaching? How do you keep your teams competing at such a high level year after year after year, even with the, with the turnover that you have? I mean, you still continue to get great players and, and just what's your secret? If well, I don't know if it's really a secret. I mean, you, you know, I don't think it's the secret is, you know, trying, you know, coaching is sales a lot of times and you're just trying to, to get people in the recruiting process who are competitive, who, you know, want to work hard and be a part of what you're trying to accomplish. So it's, there's a lot of ways to, to be successful and there's a lot of ways to train and a lot of ways to do things. And, you know, I think some of our best teams maybe weren't teams that had the greatest success, but teams that played really well together and liked each other. And, you know, I've had some teams, I think, that played farther into the season that I couldn't wait for the season to be over. So, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, I think there's, you know, if you've coached a really long time and, you know, like your dad and I have, there's some stretches where you have you have collections of players that are really good and you just wish you could push the button and get, let's forget the preseason. Let's forget the competitive season. Let's just get to the postseason and see if we're capable of, of winning the championship because you know, you have a team that's capable of doing it. So, you know, there are some years where your teams go farther than others. And there's some years where they're, you know, they kind of underachieve, but you know, the goal, every year is to just work really hard and, you know, try and steal some points in different areas. You, you know, you, you have to be realistic. There's some years where the other teams are better than you and you, you have to work on other areas to be better. So that's, that's why a position like you or like you and your mother played, that's why that setting position is so important. So the coach can say to somebody else, Hey, you're the setter. You fix it. I'm going to go sit outside in the sun. <laughs> oh, what's, this is a tough question and you probably can't answer that, can't answer it, but is there one player that you've just really enjoyed coaching at Penn State or one player that really stood out to you that, you know, maybe they, they weren't one of your best recruits coming in and you helped transform them into an All-American or whatever the story may be, but is there someone who just really sticks out to you? No, that that would get me in a lot of trouble, so I wouldn't do that. So, but you know, but there's been a lot of player. I know I somebody was writing a book on Nebraska, and I and I know it was fun talking about a lot of the great players over the over the years. You know that that I really enjoyed about Nebraska. So I'll, I'll wait for that book to come out. I don't want to ruin it. I want the people to buy the book. Whoever was whoever was writing the book about 
you know, so, so it might not always be the marquee players because as coaches, every, everybody knows who the marquee players are. You know, the fans are all there to say, hey, wait till you see the new kid. But boy, there's some kids, the glue, the players that do so many things well that coaches on the other, on the other sideline just say, hey, that's the one that really makes the team go. So let me ask you this. Who's been the most difficult Nebraska player that you've had to prepare for? No, there's been there's been so many. But I would say the not to not to show any disrespect to any. There there were two players that that uh, I was changing what I was doing to accommodate. One was uh, Jordan Larson for the final four at Nebraska when, when we had the team that hadn't lost any games all year because uh, I thought her jump serve was the only thing that could really jam us up and the 15,000 or whatever people that were there. I thought that combination was because I never worried about our rotation. I would start anyway because I thought we could win in any rotation, but I wanted to make sure that we had our best reception when she was serving, because I thought she could she could really uh, she could really impact you with the serve, and I and I had a plan for for uh, when Sarah Pavin played, but uh, but we lost before we got to that point in time to have our libero and the right back if we had gotten to the end of the year and the, and the playoffs. So when we played them earlier in the year, I had my libero playing left back, but we had trained if we were playing later in the year to have her in the right back because she was a really an exceptional player. And there, you know, there are some people that do things that you really, you really couldn't stop. So, but there's a, there are a lot of, uh, you know, there's a reason Nebraska volleyball has been so good for so long. You know, uh, I mean, it was great when, when, when Pat Sullivan was there and, and Terry did a great job and John has taken it to even higher levels and it's recruiting has been exceptional, but you still have to, you still have to have the players play well and they still have to play together. You know, I know when I was young and I'd go to the final four and I'd sit there and I'd say, oh, man, it must be really easy to coach UCLA or somebody like that because they have all the good players. And then fast forward, it was like, oh, man, it's not so good to have all, all good players because sometimes they're not so happy. So a lot of years I would have just enough good players to be good and then some extra players just to keep their mouths shut. Coach Cook, who, who's been the most uh, difficult player to prepare for when you match up against Penn State? Micah, <clears throat> she was the most handful player, probably, I, I, I'm not saying, I, that might be in my entire coaching career, Micah was the most disruptive player. She could do it, she did it from leadership, serving, setting, attacking as a setter. She was the most disruptive player that we had to prepare for. And, yeah, just really competitive. I mean, Mike, yeah. Micah's greatest, intangible was how competitive she was. All right, this is a question for both of you. What's your most memorable Penn State Nebraska matchup? You know, I don't I don't even know. And my you know, I, I think the only one I I I don't remember what year. I just remember it was uh it was a year we lost when I think we were undefeated. I just remember the ball rolling along the net and then falling. Uh, I don't know if John was the coach or Terry was the coach. And, and then we won the next year when like they were undefeated and, you know, but uh, I don't remember the years of it, but I just remember back in the old days, we didn't, you know, we didn't have a facility to be able to host. So back in the early years of, the NCAA, it was always at Nebraska or Illinois or Western Michigan. Those were the only schools that could really host. And so when we joined the Big Ten, we built the Bryce Jordan Center and 
as soon as we built that, then all of a sudden we had a facility because basketball was on the other side of campus. And then that allowed us, A, it gave us full scholarships, which we never had before, but it also gave us a, a, a facility that allowed us to host. Hosting gives you a great advantage. Doesn't guarantee you're gonna win, but it sure makes it a lot, uh, a lot easier to have your fans and things like that. So those, I mean, it just seems like every year when we play Nebraska, it's gonna go four or five games and it's close. And, you know, it's just, uh, it's strange. You know, last year, Nebraska struggled with Wisconsin and we thought we should have beat them both times, not just split with them. So, you know, matchups are, are, are always strange. And, you know, the Big Ten is just such a, such a competitive conference that, uh, you know, if you spend all your energy worrying about about one uh, one team, you you're going to lose to a whole bunch of other teams. Yeah, Lauren, for for me, it was a 2008 in Omaha because that's the most I've seen Russ look shell shocked and sweat and <laughs> and thankful that I mean, you could just tell that it was a, such a relief. Penn State beat us in five. I still think that's one of the greatest matches I've ever seen, uh, and probably the greatest volleyball, college volleyball team, that 2008 Penn State team. That was the one that never, never lost a set to that match. And I just remember, I'm, you know, we, we had a miracle in Washington to even get to Omaha. And of course, there's a whole nother podcast on, on how all that happened. But I remember watching them warm up. <laughs> I'm thinking, I hope we get 15 points. <laughs> And I thought, okay, at least we got here. I hope we get 15 points. And, you know, and then it ended up being in, in the fifth game and great crowd. And, Coach, I, I, I still have all – I put all the quotes of people from Nebraska who were quoted as saying it was one of the greatest sporting events they've ever seen. And, and like, one of them was Darren Erstad, uh, who was MVP of the World Series, coached baseball here, won two national championships in football here as a punter. And again, he, I, I still have the quote he wrote in the paper about how inspired he was watching that match as one of the greatest sporting events ever. But so well, I know when, when we went, we've gone to the Supreme Court a few times that, uh, you know, Clarence Thomas can't wait to talk about Nebraska volleyball <laughs> and Destiny yeah. Hooker. Yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay, That's Coach true. Rose, I, I have a few more questions for you. Yeah. Hey, Lauren, can I say one thing? And yeah. by the way, Coach, uh, Clarence will watch this podcast. So w when it goes live, we'll be hearing from him. <laughs> he's your, he's one of your biggest fans. Okay. Husker Nation wants to know what the heck you're writing down in your notebook during matches. Hi, you know, well, I mean, is it an adult coloring book and you're just, you know, when you get bored, you're just. Yeah, it's like dementia, just like dementia setting in. <laughs> no, I just think it's, uh, you know, it's statistics, it's notes, it's, uh, my goodness, what if the computers shut down, everybody freaks out, if everybody's phone went down, they'd be all, all besides themselves. I'm taking stats that if everything went down, it's not changing anything and what's going on with me, I've got all the information I need right there. Smart man. All right, the other thing Husker Nation wants to know is what you two talk about before matches. Well, you know, warm -ups. I, you know, I, I always ask John about his family and how he's doing. And, you know, we talk, he talks about his hip and how's my knee and how's his hip. And, <laughs> you know, I tell John, you know, stop jogging. That's how you hurt yourself. And, you know, it's, you know, I mean, we know it's, uh, you know, you stay, uh, you know, try and keep your team healthy and, you know, see in a couple of weeks, good luck in the tournament. You know, that's it. So nothing juicy, just a typical catch up. Yeah. Uh, I mean, we don't, we don't have any, uh, we don't have any mutual things. I can't talk to John about, you know, after I found out that he really wasn't involved in that drug sting, there was really not much else we could talk about. <laughs> For a while, I thought, man, I got a new connection here in, in Lincoln, but <laughs> told me it really wasn't true. I forgot about that. We, have, we need to talk about that on one of the next episodes. Um, all right. 
you two have both been around for a long time. Any plans to retire soon? Coach Rose, we heard you were retiring like five years ago and, and here you're still here. Yeah, well, I, I told my wife that I was coming on this show and I said, well, you know, if I said I, if I was going to announce my retirement, I should do it. I should do it on John, John and your show because it'd get a lot more attention than if I did it here because <laughs> nobody would notice here. But, uh, you know, I, I'm not naive enough to think I'm going to do it forever. And I, I'll have to be honest with you, when I do, it'll be a, it'll be a small ripple effect because, uh, you know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to do much fanfare with it. It'll just happen. And, uh, you know, I don't know if I'll be able to pull it off like Andy Banikowski did where he did it and then nobody can find him. But, uh, you know, I think volleyball's in great hands right now. There's a lot of great young coaches and, you know, the, the programs around the country are really well supported. And, you know, I think, uh, you know, a lot of us have, have done a lot of things and, and put a lot of work in to make it better for other people. Yeah. Do I need to raise my hand, Lauren? Or? Oh, you can talk. You can talk. Yeah. Um, you know, this COVID thing is has made me miss coaching a lot. And uh, so, I don't know, I kind of have a renewed fire uh, about coaching. And, uh, but I agree with Coach Rose that, uh, you know, you don't do this forever. And I'm thinking about what else I want to do. And, uh, you know, if I get an invite to go, play golf and smoke cigars on the beach in Florida, I might be, be up for that. <laughs> By the way, I told Coach Rose that uh, you were, you're going to send him cigars for being on the podcast. That's his payment. Done deal. <laughs> so we'll, we'll go. I don't really know how to shop for cigars, so we can go do that and we'll send them your way, Coach Rose. I already know where to go and how to get it done, Lauren. So it's there you go. <laughs> okay. Uh, one last question for both of you before we get to Coach Cook's favorite part, confession and lesson. Coach Rose, I hope you're prepared for that. But uh, what's the biggest lesson that, for, and again, this is for each of you, that you guys have learned in all of your years of coaching? No, I mean, I don't know. I guess the, the, the biggest lesson is it's the player's team that uh you know it's never really about us it's it's about them and the sooner the sooner you can really get the players to understand that uh, the better off the program is going to be but it but it really takes time to establish a culture and and get people to to really buy into to them caring about establishing something themselves yeah i think lauren the biggest lesson i would have is that uh, you, you can't ever sit still. You got to keep getting better. You got to keep learning. You got to keep growing. You got to keep looking at things. And, uh, you know, just like listening to coach Rose talk about his adjustments for Pavin. Like, I'm not sure I would have thought of that for a player moving, switching positions. So, I mean, that's, that's a great point of, you know, trying to get better. Uh, and figure things out and not just stay status quo. And I think that's in coaching in general for young coaches, that's, that's the biggest lesson. All right. So we're now to the end of the podcast. So it's my favorite time. Coach Cook hates this part, but Coach Rose, we're going to put you in the hot seat. So what we do is we go around and we give a confession and a lesson. So a confession is, I know you've listened to the podcast before, but just something juicy, something that maybe no one knows about you. Um, putting that confession out there. And then a lesson is just words of wisdom, words of advice, maybe a, a quote or a saying that you live by. Um, so if you're ready, we'll let you go first since you're our guest. But if you Ooh. need more time, then we can go first. <laughs> I think I need time on this here. Yeah. Okay. I'm not so, thinking we're going to repeat. Part. Yeah. You know, Coach Cook knows this is coming every single month and he still is like, I don't know what to say. Yeah. So don't feel bad. Coach Cook, do you have one though? Yeah, I got, well, we already did mine earlier that I'm a Yellowstone fan and I now have a Yellowstone oh. um, vest. Let's, so, let's show Coach Rose the picture. Yeah. So that, but I do have another confession related to. Uh, He's a cowboy. Do you watch the show Yellowstone, Coach Rose? 
My wife and I went through it very quickly. <laughs> um, but uh, no, speaking of cigars, so Coach Rose has asked me a couple times to have cigars at Final Fours and so on, and I'm just like, I can never fathom. But I've actually tried a few cigars, and I, you know, and when we're finished coaching, I, I really do want to sit down and smoke a cigar with Coach Rose. So there's my confession, and uh, we've actually talked about it because my assistant coaches do like to partake in that, and uh, they're always asking me to go to our back porch and have cigars. So there's my there's my confession, along with Yellowstone. Yeah, I like Yellowstone. It's good. I like horse country. Who's your favorite character on Yellowstone? Uh, let me think for a second. My favorite character was, uh, boy, I have to think it out. It was a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> well, I mean, it, I guess, you know, I mean, it's easy to like Costner. He was awfully, he was awfully good, but you know, I don't, I guess it was the, uh, you know, I guess it was the, the kind of like the adopted son guy there that was with the, with the daughter. I liked him. Rip. Rip. Yeah. Yeah. I liked him. Yeah. Yeah. It's a good show. Good show. You know? So my confession would be, uh, that, that people didn't know that when I was a kid, we, uh, we had a, a stable in Chicago on the north side of Chicago. And uh, my mother was the first person that entered African Americans in the International Horse Show in Chicago. So we, uh, we used to ride horses when I was a little kid all the time. So English or Western? Uh, Western, but uh, you know, obviously we we owned a stable, so we you know there was English side saddle. There was uh, people did a whole bunch of things, but we had livery. But uh, the facility itself was, and then we had a stable right out, uh, not far from the airport. And uh, now, if you know the area, O'Hare. It, it didn't take very long for all that land to become much more valuable for the airport. So as the times were back in the day, that land was more valuable. And, uh, you know, we'll just say some other people wanted that land. And uh, in, uh, in Chicago politics and Chicago land, uh, that's the way the world went. My, uh, you know, the, the other partner, uh, unfortunately got ran over by a train and we got out of the uh, horse world uh, at that point in time. So that was probably when I was about 13 or 14 years old. So that was our old horse business. So I used to ride horses all the time as a kid. Man, that is a hell of a confession right there. That is. Yep. That's awesome. I like that. Yeah, I like the horse world. Yep. Uh, I'm going to, I'm going to top that confession though. And I've been keeping a, a pretty big secret, but I'm actually seven months pregnant and Coach Cook is going to be a grandpa. I'm going to be a mom. Henley back here is going to be a big sister. Um, so we're doing November. Thank goodness volleyball season got postponed. Otherwise, it, it would have been a little crazy having a, a newborn baby in the Cook family, Cook West family. But um, we'll, we'll have a new addition in November. Well, that is unbelievable news and you know i'm i i, I mean whether i hope it's uh yeah I, I hope it's healthy if it's a girl i'm gonna have to say having probably the only person that coached against your mother in her senior year at uh, san diego state at the aiw championships and then you in college, I'm going to have to pass and not be able, if you have a daughter, coach against her. So it, I'm going to have to bow out. It is a girl. So, you know, maybe one of you will stick around long enough for her to, by the time she's in college. John, you're on. 
<laughs> All right. Do you guys have lessons? Any lessons? Words of advice, words of wisdom? Always have a dog that matches the pillow. That's a good one. <laughs> Isn't she? Are you a dog, a dog lover, Coach Rose? Uh, yeah, yeah, we're, uh, we're into the golden retriever world, yeah. Okay, perfect. Henley's a golden doodle. Dad, do you have a lesson? Uh, no, Lauren, I'm just, uh, I think this is awesome that Coach Rose is on this podcast, and uh, this is going to be great. People are going to love this, and uh, thanks for pulling it together, and thanks to Coach Rose for getting on. I think it's, it's pretty cool. Yeah. I, yeah, Coach Rose, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule. I know you're working really hard right now, unlike Coach Cook. And uh, we just, we really appreciate you being on this podcast or this, ep this month's episode, this podcast. And again, Husker Nation was asking for you. They've been tweeting in. Do you know what Twitter is? Uh, I'm not a part of it, but, you know, again, I'm, I'm here because I just love the interaction between you and your dad. Thanks. And uh, I wish you both the best in you and uh, you and your new family. And uh, Thank you. John, we'll see, you, we'll see you tomorrow on our uh, quiet uh, Big Ten coaches call and good health to everybody. We'll see you when we see you. Perfect. All right. Thanks, Thank Coach, you, Rose. Coach Rose. Thank you, Coach Cook. And we'll see you all next month with a different surprise guest. Go Big Red.